åka fem mil imorgon. Det är upp som är på väg mot Dalarna där, så vi flyger söder i Mötland. Vi får låta honom passera, så kommer vi lägga oss bakom honom. Titta på raden först kommer vi göra. Och sen kommer vi titta och se om det är så här, och då kommer vi att titta och se. Vi kan vilja vaka mellan till nummer 24. Det ska gå upp på där. Vi säkrar om. Det här siktet är inte till för rom och den skottet, men det är till för avkan och sånt sen.
lösning nu då bara att skjuta då har lyft upp sikten lite grann så här där kan vi gå ut va vi trycker av här och igen nej, jag bara får att flyga på benen där vi drar över takar nu och åker med den ta långa lösarna han är träffad va? Ja han är träffad. Jag får skjuta igen. Ja jag får skjuta. Han är alltid Han är så svänger den här med så här. Han är körd i alla fall. Ja det är riktigt kul. Sass plan där och trend upp. Vänta. Håll på full gas. In med luftkroppen. Ska jag mälla dem eller? Ja, gör det. Det är inte svårt där. Ja, snyggt. Så. Det är en grön kort mot Alan. Nu drar vi igen så får du inte fri flygning när vi börjar landa på sista gången sen. Ja. Så.
Ja, mijn euro staat. Jag måste vara fram. Borde här en ligga någonstans ute där nu. Ja, jag ser inte det stora snabbområdet där men det kanske bara att det inte finns på... Nej. Nej, men det känns som att det ska vara där i alla fall. Det är bra att hitta en
Det är det. Det är mot oss. Rådan lägger i drog. Sen tar du vänster och sen höger vänster igen. Ja, ja. Så det kan jag hoppa. Jag ska ta den här också. Vi ska se. Ska passa. You didn't need to wait for a command in this situation. There was fire and I shouted to Suzanne, fire on the wing. She ran back to my exit and saw Suzanne standing there getting ready to open the door and just saw the door crumple like cheap tin foil. And I thought, oh my God, we're trapped. I was staring at the door and I yelled, Unfasten your seatbelts, remove your shoes, leave everything, come this way. And as I stared at the door, a jagged hole seemed to open up in the roof over the door. And the next thing I knew, I was outside that. I, I don't know how I got out there. Joan was standing there yelling, Suzanne, take my hand. And I was standing above the level of the door on fuselage rubble pieces. And I leaned down and said to Suzanne, give me your hand. She grabbed me out with one hand. I mean, I don't know how she lifted me. And then we were standing up on top of the, almost on top of this airplane. And I thought, it's really a long ways down. If we jump, we're going to break our legs. We were on debris. It was like ice flows, big chunks of fuselage kind of moving all around. The engines were starting to disintegrate already. We could hear them disintegrating and throwing metal. I lost Joan's hand very quickly, so I jumped. And it was about, it seemed like the leap from a second story building. The captain, he elected to jump down in the first class section of the airplane. And when he hit the first class floor, the floor collapsed and he fell on down in the cargo area. It was so hot that the oxygen bottles exploded and burned him very badly, as a matter of fact. It was a survival mode that, that kicked in and it was just get out of that airplane. I didn't stop to think about how it happened. I went to where the door would have been and I left my wife seated. And then uh, it came to me, what am I doing? I should, where, where's my wife? So I turned around and she was coming and I said, I will jump and try and break your fall. My husband was sitting to my right and, and I undid his seat belt and kind of pushed him out of his seat to get him moving. And we headed for the door that was closest to us. And it was engulfed in flames. And there was no way to exit that way. I looked over, and at some point, someone had opened the other door, which was amazing to me. And I just yelled over here and headed toward the door on the other side, <clears throat> which was, again, the wing door. Um, in the haste to get out of the burning plane, Karen became separated from her husband. He died in the flames. I immediately thought it was total destruction. It never dawned on me that I would make it. But I, I thought, hey, you know, do something. Don't just sit there, do something. I just went over the seat backs and I'm not that athletic really but <laughs> I went over three rows of seats one man was sitting there looking like I need help but I couldn't help him when KLM hit us all communication stopped the tower called and couldn't get any response from either the KLM or ourselves there was an airplane in the holding pattern right above Tenerife. Called the tower and said, I see smoke and wreckage on your runway. Rodeus approach Sterling 105. We're downwind from runway 30 and something's glowing on the field. Looks like a fire. Are you aware of any fire? Shit, this can't be true! Come on, come on! Come on, come on! 
He hits the emergency warning. After KLM hit us, he went on down the runway and hit on the runway 1,500 feet down, closer to the tower. So when the fire truck and the ambulance came out, they got to him first. So no one came to us for quite a while. As a matter of fact, I remember thinking, I wonder why somebody hasn't gotten out here to help us. It's complete bedlam. In the fog, the fire trucks don't know where to go. When they eventually find the Dutch plane, it's hopeless. Everyone's dead. And the whole time, they don't realize there's a second plane a short distance away, hidden in the mist, with people waiting to be saved. It's another 20 minutes before the Pan Am plane is discovered. Only 20% of the Pan Am passengers get out alive, and most of them are gathered on the left wing, which has somehow miraculously remained intact. The entire left wing of the airplane was covered with passengers, and it turned out there were probably 45 to 50 passengers out on that wing. I've never asked anybody how high the wing is from the ground on a 747, but it looks to be a very long ways. And I cut open my head and fractured my foot. My wife jumped after me, and she said, I cannot walk. And I dragged her on her side for probably a block and a half away from the plane. The motors were going full tilt, and I didn't want to get over where the motors were, so I sat down by the body of the plane. I had no comprehension at that moment that I would be jumping off the wing and... <laughs> In the debris, you knew there were trapped passengers and people, and there was absolutely nothing you could do to help because the airplane was collapsing in on people. Only one door was opened by a crew member, and that was one of the black flight attendants who did that. And she lost her life when the engine disintegrated and debris hit her. And I thought if we could just walk around to the other side of the plane, we would find all of the passengers and our other fellow crew members, which, of course, wasn't the case. Even 20 minutes after the disaster, the controllers in the tower still have no idea how serious things are. Departing aircraft. All departures are suspended until advised. Hello. Fire out here. Notify the ambulance. We have an emergency. We need every vehicle they've got. We're done. It's copy our fault. I'm here. I told him to clear the taxiway. When I got out on the ground, I could hear people screaming and yelling and all. Within about five minutes, you heard absolutely nothing. There was no noise at all, just the, air, the airplane burning. I asked one of our medical directors later on what had caused that, and he said that when you have a fire that hot and that much of a fire, it consumes all of the oxygen in there, and people basically suffocate. I felt so responsible because I couldn't take care of my passengers and so helpless in looking back and knowing that there's nothing you can do. You can't get back in the aircraft. There's no way to get in it and it's all on fire. Of the KLM plane, very little remains. It had continued flying for another 400 meters before slamming into the ground. The 55 tons of fuel it had taken on ensured that everyone on board died in the fiery explosion. It was personal vehicles, cars and trucks, that seemed to come onto the grass and gather up people. About 75% of our surviving passengers got to the hospital in taxi cabs. It was a wild, 
crazy ride as we were going to the hospital. The skin was hanging on both hands because I had received burns, but it hadn't affected my eyes. I had blood all over me, and I walked up to somebody and said, I'm a doctor, can I help? And the guy that I taught, said it to had the oddest look on his face, it, just this um, very wan smile, and he just shook his head, and then, then I immediately went into a coma. Word soon gets out, and in the hours that follow, the international press begin to arrive and the first news is flashed around the world. The rescue workers are still going through the wreckage of the two jet liners this morning in the Canary Islands. They're looking for the bodies of victims in this worst accident in aviation history. Two jumbo jet liners, 747s, collided on the ground at the airport at Santa Cruz de Tenerife yesterday morning. One was a Pan Am charter from Los Angeles that picked up more people in New York before flying to the Canaries. The other was a KLM charter from Amsterdam in the Netherlands. They set up a, a, a morgue in one of the hangars, and it was huge, and they had all of the nearly 600 bodies in, in that particular hangar, or temporary morgue. The death toll rises to 583 people, nearly twice as big as any previous accident. And then everyone begins asking the same questions. How and why could two state-of-the-art airliners smash into each other on the same runway? Very soon, a whole army of investigators begins arriving from the three countries involved, Spain, Holland, and the United States. Under the rules that govern this sort of thing, they all have a right to be there but that doesn't mean they're going to get along. In Spain, the military still runs everything, including aviation. When the American team from the National Transportation Safety Board arrives, the Spanish general in charge won't even let them into the room. I sneaked in, and I went to the general, and I told him, the general, uh, my name is Luis Carmona, I represent the US government, the NTSB, and I am here to participate in the investigation. He answered back to me, uh, I represent the king, and you get out. <laughs> so as I walk, was walking out, he looked at me again and he said, hey, you don't look American. And uh, I told him, well, yes, I am an American, but I was born in Cuba. And he said, well, so, so did I. I was also born in Cuba. So he turned around, then he asked me questions and asked me to bring my team in, and we started the, doing the accident investigation then. The investigators discover the chain of coincidences that had led remorselessly to the deaths of 583 people. If any one of them had not occurred, neither would the accident. The first had nothing to do with airplanes. A terrorist bombing perpetrated by a small group fighting for their independence. Their intent was to create publicity for their cause. In that, they certainly succeeded. There are two bombs in the terminal. You have 10 minutes to save as many lives as you wish. The airport is closed. Divert to Rosoleos Airport via Tenerife VOR. Descent flight level 250. Because of the bomb, all air traffic was rerouted to Los Rodeos Airport on the neighboring island of Tenerife. But it's a small regional airfield with only one runway. A 747 can land there. The runway is long enough, but that's all. The airport is ill-equipped and unable to handle that amount of planes or people. Lima Tango 107, you are clear to descend to flight level 80. Sunday 282, switch to ground now. Contact standby for taxi clearance. KLM 4805, clear to land runway 30. Pan Am 1736. Pan Am 1736, short final. As luck would have it, this tidal wave of traffic happens on a Sunday afternoon when there are just two controllers on duty. They're good, but not used to handling as many airplanes as on that day. Big airplanes that need lots of room to park. They are confronted with an enormous jigsaw puzzle. We'll be here all night, you know that, right? 
Or you can go out there and dig us another runway. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the KLM cockpit, the stress is mounting. Any idea of how much longer we've got before we need to get other crew down to take over? Yeah, well... KLM had recently introduced new company rules, which handed out severe penalties for pilots who exceeded their flying hours. What happens if we go over the civil and company time limits? Well, you get hung out to dry. You lose your license, your career, everything. The KLM plane has to get away before 5.30 that afternoon or abandon the flight. Hundreds of passengers would then have to be found hotels on this small island. A new crew would have to be flown in from Amsterdam. The expense would be enormous. Willem, since we're trapped in here until the passengers get back, we might as well take on some fuel. But that seemingly simple decision seals the fate of everyone aboard the KLM. Refueling not only delays him for half an hour and the Pan Am stuck behind him, it makes the KLM plane so heavy it'll be unable to lift off and clear the Pan Am plane on the runway. The half-hour delay has another effect. During that time, the weather changes abruptly. Los Rodeos is an unusual airport. It's on a plateau high in the hills. The Los Rodeos airport is, uh, is at 2,000 feet elevation. And the normal clouds in the area, they, they stay about 2,000 feet. So when the wind blows the clouds over the airport, it closes the airport. The, 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 the visibility goes to zero. And it goes on and off, on and off, all the time. Unfortunately, for an airport that's constantly lost in fog, Los Rodeos is ill-equipped to deal with it. It has no ground radar so that controllers can see where the planes are. In fact, the facilities are downright primitive. When he was not, they had a person sitting in a building next to the runway, and he just took a visual uh, measurement of the weather, and that's, that's how the weather was uh, checked. And that's about all. In the fog that day, both aircraft are invisible to the controllers. I lost them. I can't see no visual contact. There are no runway center lights working either. Visibility is on the borderline of what is safe. In fact, as far as the Pan Am crew is concerned, it's below the legal minimum, so no aircraft can take off. Look at it out there. I mean, this cloud just rolled right onto us. I don't think anybody has the minimums now. But the Dutch are working to a different set of rules. The scene is all set for a disaster. What will actually trigger it? The Dutch investigators thought they'd found the reasons. God damn it. Of all the days this has to happen. Just when Spain is going to teach Hungary a lesson in football. The controllers, they say, were listening to the football on the radio. Perhaps their minds weren't on the job. Furthermore, their bad English had confused the pilots. Taxi into the runway. And leave the runway third. Third to your left. Third to the left, OK. Third, he said? Three. Third. Third to your left. I, I thought he leave said Leave the first. runway third to your left. Third. third one, sir. One, two, three. Third. Third one. One, two. Good. Well, that's what we need, right? The third one. Uno, dos, tres. We were listening to the controller talking to the other airplanes. We were listening to the controller giving the ATC clearances, the taxi clearances. And he spoke clear enough English for anyone, I think. So I'd have to say, no, I don't think the controller was involved at all. Uh, I don't think he had any fault at all in, in this accident. 1736, just check in. Yeah, that. that's the 45 there. But the yeah. Dutch haven't finished yet. Yeah, that's uh, this one here. Yeah, I know. They make an even more controversial claim, one that provokes a blazing row, that the Pan Am plane had caused the accident by being on the runway when it shouldn't have been. They hadn't followed orders to turn off. OK, for sure. Maybe he counts these as three. Oh, oh I like this. They were, they were going to taxiway four. He was instructed to go on three, but he had to go four because taxiway number four was the one that had 45 degrees, and it was easy for the 747 to access it. We said, confirm which taxiway you want to take, and he says, 
the third on your left, one, two, three, the third on your left. And we, and here again, I still believe this, I think he had seen us go by the first one, and when he says count three more taxiways, the third, one, two, three, it, we were doing exactly what we thought he meant for us to do, and I still think that's what he meant for us to do. It was the logical taxiway to take. Whether they should have taken the third or fourth exit became largely irrelevant anyway, because it became clear that Captain Van Zanten had made one of the most elementary mistakes a pilot can make. He'd taken off without permission. We have 700 meters visibility here now. Wait a minute. We don't have ATC clearance. I know that. Go ahead, ask. Uh, KLM 4805 uh, is now ready for takeoff. Um, we're waiting for ATC clearance. KLM 4805, you're clear to the Papa Beacon. The KLM is given its ATC clearance, which is simply the route it must follow after takeoff. Now it must wait for permission to take off. 325 Radial at Las Palmas VOR. Roger, sir, we're cleared to the Papa Beacon, uh, flight level 90. Uh, right turn out 040 until intercepting the 325. Um, we're now... We're going. But why didn't his crew stop him? It's very difficult for a co-pilot or a flight engineer to tell the captain, hey, look, you missed something. Tenerife exposed a problem that had long existed in commercial air travel. The pilot was regarded, and often regarded himself, as God. The captain is always right. He's never wrong. No junior officer was ever going to contradict the airline's top pilot, the man who'd given him his license. Bottom 1736, report runway clear. Did you clear that? What do you say? Is it to clear the Pan Am? Oh, yes. Captain Van Zanten, highly stressed, knowing that he has to take off or abandon the flight. His crew, aware that he's done wrong, but frightened to tell him. Disaster is now inevitable. God damn. The official report is written by Spain. It blames the accident on Captain Van Zanten's decision to take off without permission. The Dutch refuse to accept it. They publish their own report, blaming language difficulties and the general confusion at Los Rodeos. What I learned from the Tenerife accident is that regardless of how well qualified, experienced, professional, and, and exact professional you are, Okay, accidents, as long as human beings are involved, accidents can always take place. The insurers pay out a record sum, $2 billion in today's money. As for the survivors, the images of the 27th of March will always be with them. They've just learned to live with them, that's all. And whenever I have friends that travel, I tell them, make sure you know where your exit is, make sure you read all that stuff, know how to get out of the airplane. I mean, those are important things. I never had nightmares. I had only dreams about being helpless and being at an airport behind a big, thick window and watching an airplane take off and knowing that it was going to crash and wanting to shout out, but there's this big, thick glass window. You're just helpless, and you, that's what you feel is this, because our responsibility is to take care of everyone, and that's what we want to do, and we couldn't do it. We couldn't save them. The loss of my husband had a tremendous impact on, on my life, on my son's life, on my extended family's lives. It was huge. And you can see how f strange life is, you know, it, that things like that happen. That you get off and they go on and, uh, and perhaps if it's the plane left a minute later, it wouldn't have happened. I think it brought home to me how quickly you can leave this life and how everyone should uh, enjoy life every and each day as much as you possibly can. Well, after the crash, I decided to start a family. <laughs> I thought maybe I will stay home and have children. I thought, you know, my friends have died and if I let myself sit in this little apartment, it's gonna be as if I'm curled up and died and that's not fair to them. I can honor them best by 
living a life, a full life, and not being afraid. I am blessed because I do not have any horror left over from the accident. I felt ashamed the first while. And a long, long time I, I thought, you know, I wish I died because I felt very bad. I was scared for quite a while after the crash, but I knew if I flew with Joan, she would pull me out again. I had to quit the NTSB. I, I didn't retire. I felt so bad that I became ill. I had to go to a doctor and, uh, and get some medication because I, I, I got sick. I went back to Tenerife, my wife and I, and I had a driver take me out to the airport and show me the runway, and uh, I looked at it all. I did it all over again. And then I went back and took the Golden Odyssey steamship from the Royal Cruise Line to uh, sort of complete the situation which I had missed. 